Okay, uh, hello everyone again. And uh, so this is the lecture number five, our numerical analysis of electric devices uh, curves. Lecture number uh, five. And this part will be about uh, Maxwell equations in, in free space continue. Uh, Maxwell equations in free space continue. Uh, <clears throat> so the previous one was number number five. Okay, so the next one is number six. The point number six and uh, so the previous one was about <clears throat> uh, divergence of electric field. Okay, and this divergence of electric field is equal to the density of electric charges. And uh, this is, by the way, just because the electric charges, they exist in, in nature, right? We know that, uh, we know the charge of one electron, we know the charge of one uh, proton, we know that neutrons have no electric charge so the particles can be of uh, two types, charged particles and uh, uh, neutral particles. Uh, and uh, when we talk about charge, it's always the electric charge. But what about magnetic charge? If magnetic field exists in nature, uh, maybe there is a source of magnetic field. And uh, actually the experiment tells us like very precise experiments. By the way, the experiments still continue and scientists still put a lot of effort to observe, to find these magnetic charges. They call them monopoles, monopoles. And uh, so far, we have observed no magnetic charges. So at least at our, I mean, at our scale, right? Uh, these magnetic charges, these magnetic monopoles don't exist. So let us write this as a, as an experimental fact. So no magnetic charges, no magnetic. Uh, no magnetic charges in nature. <clears throat> Pretty interesting fact. <clears throat> so electric field is created by electric charges, but in the same in the same time we have magnetic field, but magnetic field don't have any <clears throat> any charges. And the magnetic field is created by the moving uh, moving charges, right? Moving electric charges. Uh, let's also note this: no, on a, no monopoles, Mo, mag, magnetic magnetic mo, monopoles. Magnetic. No magnetic monopoles. What it means? It means that if I try to find the flux of magnetic field around any surface, uh, any surface like this, right, which is uh, would be equal to the the total number of magnetic charges, magnetic charges. So the experiment tells us that this integral, this charge is equal to zero, which hence that the flux of magnetic field through any surface, <clears throat> even through the surface of the universe. Okay, it's always equal to zero. Uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, on the other hand, we can rewrite this flux using the uh, divergence theorem through into the volume integral 
of the divergence uh, B, right, dV, <clears throat> the volume, and still equal to zero. So it means that for any volume, for any arbitrary volume, this integral can be equal to zero only if uh, the divergence of magnetic field is equal to zero in any place in the in the in the space. So we call this Maxwell equation number two. This is Maxwell equation number two, and it's simple state statement that uh, magnetic uh, charges don't exist. Okay. Uh, so we can we can call this also magnetic Gauss law. Magnetic Gauss law by analogy with the previous electric Gauss law. Okay. All right. So this is the second second Maxwell equation. Pretty pretty interesting one. All right. So the point number seven. We call this Ampere's law. Ampere, Ampere's law, okay, Ampere's law. <clears throat> so this law is about circulation of, uh, it's about circulation of magnetic field, okay. And uh, the best way to introduce this law is to uh, first consider the bios uh, uh, law, right? Bio, B, bio Sauert, Sauert law. Uh, so this is kind of analog to the Coulomb law in the uh, for the but for the magnetic field, so it's uh, analog analog to the Coulomb Coulomb law for magnetic field magnetic field. Okay, so Bios Howard law states that uh, if you have a current. If you have a wire with a current element, okay, so this this wire uh, supports or conducts current I, okay, and uh, if we take an element of this current, let's denote it by dL. So dL is the element of the length with length of the wire with the current. Okay, and then I select any point in space, like here, for example, and take the uh, the radius vector from my current element to the to this uh, point in space, right? So I I denote it by r, and uh, the unit vector uh, in the direction of this of this point is. Uh, N, N vector, okay. So <clears throat> the magnetic field, or in this case, the element of magnetic field, or the, the magnetic field of this infinitesimally small element of wire is equal to, is equal to <clears throat> mu sub zero over four pi, times I D L vector. Okay, so this uh, 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 this uh, current element, of course, has a orientation in space. So and it's denoted by D L vector cross N vector, which is unitary vector in the direction of the uh, observation point. Okay, uh, over R squared. Okay, so this is Biosauer law, Biosauer formula, uh, which defines the 
magnetic field of any small element of current. And then if you have a, uh, like a, uh, the wire of any shape, like a coil, like a, I mean, whatever, any uh, wire of any shape. And if this current or this wire supports current, then you can discretize this wire by small elements, okay? Find the magnetic field from all these elements in a, uh, in a, some particular point in, in space, and then sum up all these contributions from all the currents, from all the ele current elements. And this way you will get magnetic field from any complex uh, the uh, wire of any complex shape. Shape. All right. So this is bio sour law. And as an example of using this formula, let us consider a problem. Problem. Uh, B field. So let's uh, find B field field of a of a very long wire. So very long wire here uh, essentially means infinitely long wire. Okay. So let us let us draw the wire like this. And this wire then goes up and goes down like this. Um, and let's orient this wire along uh, Z direction. Okay, so it is Z direction uh, along Z direction. And let's consider one point somewhere. Uh, uh, some, uh, let's consider the, the element of this, of, this, uh, of this wire, for example, here. It's going to be our uh, DZ, right? Uh, our D, DZ. Okay. And also pick up a point in which we evaluate the magnetic field. So for a very long wire, it doesn't uh, uh, that the magnetic field in any point in this plane, right, will be, it's not plane, it, at any distance r. Uh, let's, let's, let's make it r, r0. Okay, so this r0. So in any point at this line will be will be the same because the wire is is uh, is very long okay so next <clears throat> the so this is this r0 is the distance from be, between the r between the wire and the observation point here and now we need also to uh, draw the distance from the element dz this is DZ. So this is the uh, this is our R. Okay, so this is the distance between the the current elements and the observation point. Okay, and uh, this are in this direction uh, can be also described by the angle between the wire and uh, and the and the vector r so let's let's denote it by theta okay so <clears throat> so from um and let's also count z let us count z in the in in the reverse direction down okay this is z this is zero all right so from this uh right angle uh triangle 
we have uh, we have uh, we, we we can we can find we can find r so for this for, to apply this formula here this uh bios our formula what we need we need the we need to know r of course r depends along the along the wire um the further i take the point the uh, current element the larger this r and, and also this angle uh changes from uh from 90 degree to um, zero okay so we need to define this r and uh, from pythagoras theorem the r squared or i is equal to the square root of uh, r zero squared plus uh, z squared okay so the z is the coordinate of our uh, current element okay so next <clears throat> what we need next uh, the z um, the z vector uh, well in in this formula here it was the l vector now we denote the the length by z so it's a dz vector times uh, cross n okay so it's uh dz is uh, this direction this is dz vector um r or n n is here so this is the n n vector <clears throat> So it's given it's given by dz times cosine theta. Okay, so the amplitude of this uh, is given by dz times oops sorry sine of course for the for the cross product sine theta. Okay. Uh, so what else? Yeah, and of course we need to know this sine theta. So for the sine theta, again, from this uh, triangle here, uh, we see that sine theta is equal to rho zero over rho, which is square root of rho zero squared plus z squared, right? Yeah, looks, looks good. Okay, so now we can <clears throat> plug in all these three formulas to the Biosauer law and get the formula that works in our case. So it's constant mu zero over four pi. Okay, and then current, then <clears throat> dl or dz times n is equal to d z uh, sine sin theta over r r squared so r squared gives us r zero square plus <clears throat> z squared okay and sine theta so let's write it uh, maybe let's write it maybe here So I need to plug in the formula for the sine theta, which is <clears throat> which is r zero um, over square root of <clears throat> r squared plus z squared. So the total will be r zero squared plus z squared three half, right? Looks <clears throat> looks good. Okay, so and then in order to get the the final contribution from all the <clears throat> current elements, I need to integrate this formula, and as a result, I will get the total uh, B field. So in our case, it will be like scalar uh, B field. So mu sub zero is a constant, 
for pi is a constant, the current is a constant too, and uh, the current, the, the integration starts from minus infinity to plus infinity. So we assume that the wire is infinitely long. Okay, so what's what, what we have left? R0 dz over R0 squared plus z squared three, <clears throat> three half, something like this. So first of all, uh, since the, the geometry is symmetric, like the, it is a wire and uh, it is symmetric around this middle point around zero, so we can actually take this integral from zero to plus infinity and simply multiply by two, <clears throat> right? Okay. And uh, <clears throat> so we have this integral, one can use Mathematica or MATLAB to take this integral. I, I just write the final very famous formula for this. So the result is, that magnetic field is proportional to the current and of course multiply by mu zero and it's gonna be two pi uh, r r zero. Okay, so the integral of, uh, I mean, this integral will be equal one, it will be equal to one over r zero, I guess. Okay, so this is the, <clears throat> this is the magnetic field. I guess this is uh, like, uh, high school formula for the magnetic field of the infinite wire, right? We can even take this formula into a... <clears throat> into the frame. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> this is about magnetic field of a of a wire uh, and uh, uh, this way we can find, for example, numerically, the magnetic field of a wire of any shape. So we discretize the wire by uh, small elements. We, we know this experimentally, experimentally observed or experimentally found formula for the magnetic field of a small piece of wire by Biot-Sauart law, okay? And uh, yeah, and uh, simply uh, summing up all the contributions from small wire elements give us the, uh, the magnetic field of the entire, entire system, entire wire. But for now, let us consider a uh, uh, closed loop. Uh, it's known also as ampere, amperian loop, ampere loop. So it's an auxiliary loop uh, just, I mean, used for, for calculation. So it's not made of any wire, it's just a uh, loop. Okay, so let's consider, consider a closed, closed loop. Ampere, um, peer loop uh, in magnetic field. Okay. <clears throat> in magnetic field. Uh, and the uh, R will be the radius of this of this circular of the circle uh, loop to radius radius of the loop <clears throat> and we ask what is the uh, what is the <clears throat> circulation of magnetic field of the circulation of magnetic field around this closed loop, around, around the loop. <clears throat> okay. 
Okay. So for example, I have a wire like this. This wire supports current I, okay? And I surround this wire with a ampere loop like this, with the radius R capital. This is the radius of the, of the loop, okay? And uh, we also have this, so this loop gets a length. The length of this loop will be 2p, 2 pi times r, okay? And it also gets this uh, area, which is pi r capital square, okay? And, uh, and we find, or we after the circulation of the magnetic field. Okay, so circulation of any field is the uh, is the closed integral, line integral of the field. In our case, it is B vector over over this uh, loop L. So it's DL per element. Okay, for the wire, the magnetic field uh, because of the symmetry of the wire, the magnetic field at any point of this of this loop is the same. Okay, so we can take this magnetic field from from the integral since it's uh, constant, and the integral over of the of the loop length gives us the uh, length of the loop, which is two pi r capital. <clears throat> okay, uh, and uh, we just found the magnetic field for this long wire which is this formula above, okay? So let us substitute for the magnetic field, this formula. Okay, so we plug in this formula for the magnetic field of the wire, okay? So we get mu zero i over two pi r capital, <clears throat> because r zero now is the r capital, okay? And uh, we can go ahead and uh, cancel down 2 pi r, okay? <clears throat> and we get mu zero i. So this is the, <clears throat> this is the answer. So what we get, we get that, uh, what we got? We got that uh, the circulation of magnetic field around this closed loop is equal to mu zero i. i is the current, mu zero is the magnetic constant, and circulation is given by this, uh, <clears throat> this integral here, okay? So now we recall that b vector is equal to, is connected to the h field through the mu zero, right? And then if I substitute this, if I, Plug in this formula to the one above. Uh, we get this mu zero, which cancel uh, on both sides, and finally we get this final formula for the <clears throat> for the magnetic field for the H field. It's equal to the current. So very very simple uh, very simple formula. So the circulation <clears throat> of magnetic field around the closed loop <clears throat> uh, that, that surrounds the wire with current I is simply equal to the, <clears throat> to the current in, the, in this wire. So this is known as Ampere's law. Ampere. Ampere's law, okay. <clears throat> So we've got the uh, integral. So now we want to rewrite this integral form of the Ampere's law into the differential form of the Ampere's law, which is applicable to any point in, in space, okay? To do so, we can, we notice that we can rewrite this <clears throat> circulation through the, uh, using the curl Integrate integral theorem, right? This 
uh, the fact that the circulation of any field around any closed loop is equal to the flux of the curl. So the flux of the curl of this field uh, through the area of, <clears throat> of the loop. So this, uh, this pink area here. So this is the area S. Okay, so I, I integrate the flux of the curl of magnetic field through uh, through the area surrounded by the uh, by the loop. Okay, and it's equal to and it's equal to the uh, current, right? So the current is equal to the current density and uh, times the element of the surface. So this is the integral. So it's basically the total current that goes through this, uh, the area of the loop. And it's equal to the integration of the current density and by the, by the area, okay. So this is equal to the current integral ds. Okay, so this integral is equal uh, for any arbitrary surface. <clears throat> and we come to this important conclusion that the curl of magnetic field is equal to the current, current density. Okay. Current density. Uh, <clears throat> So this is not final result because this is uh, this result is uh, true if the field is static. If the field is static, and in the AC field, alternating field, uh, this result is gonna change. And we're gonna discuss how. But before that, let us maybe discuss a few <clears throat> a few problems about Ampere's law because it's pretty. I mean, it's a pretty important result. So let us <clears throat> let us consider a few problems, maybe one or two. Uh, so the problem, problem one, on using this Ampere's law for the for the static for the static currents and for the static fields. Okay, so as a first problem, let's find let's find a magnetic field in uh, inside and outside of a long uh, cylindrical conductor of a radius A. So we have long uh, cylindrical conductor, like a metal. Uh, <clears throat> cylindrical conductor uh, with radius A. So rad A is the radius. We can actually substitute it by R capital, right? So it's a radius of of the cylinder uh, with a uniform uniform um, or uniformly distributed uh, current I zero. Okay, so this is the the current in the in the in the cylinder. So let's draw the picture. So this is our cylinder like this. <clears throat> so this cylinder supports a electric current. This is the current J. It's uniformly distributed, so it's uh, the same in the center and the surface, okay? 
And uh, the fact that um, and 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 let us and let us draw this Ampere's loop uh, first inside the the cylinder like this. So this is Ampere's loop with the radius r small. So r small the radius radius of the Ampere. Uh, loop and peer loop. Okay, so the ampere loop gets the arbitrary radius, and uh, if I change this radius from zero or from very small <clears throat> number uh, value uh, to the size of the of the cylinder. The, the number of the current density lines increases, right? From, uh, well, zero up to the current density that is, that corresponds to the total, total um, current in the, in the cylinder I, I zero, okay? So the current, so the current that goes through this, uh, Ampere loop increases from zero up to the I zero and uh, increases, of course, linearly with the size of the, uh, of the, the value of the area of this loop. Okay, the larger area, the larger, the larger current. So we can write this as a ratio. So let's denote IR small. So it's a current that goes through the <clears throat> through the Ampere loop of radius R small. Okay. So if I divide this R uh, uh, this current through the Ampere loop by the the total current from this through the cylinder, it's going to be equal to the area of the ampere loop, which is pi r small squared over the total area of the, uh, the base area of the, of the cylinder, which is pi r capital squared. Okay, so pi cancel out. And we come to the conclusion that the current uh, changes on the size on the size of the of the ampere loop as I mean, like this way so it's a current i0 times r squared over r capital squared okay so this is the this is the current if i substitute 0 for the for the radius of the ampere loop i get zero current uh, i mean obviously apparently uh, if I substitute R capital, I get I zero. Okay, and this current grows with the size of them, of the Ampere slope. Okay, so this is the <clears throat> this is the current, and for any size, uh, for any Ampere slope of any of any radius of any size, we have the Ampere law, which states that the circulation of a magnetic field. So let us let us write first inside. So it's a field inside, so which is R small is less than R capital. Okay. So now the circulation of magnetic field over the uh, over the ampere loop. Let's put in. So it's inside magnetic field inside is equal to the current that surround, surrounded by this ampere slope, which is IR, okay? So again, because of the symmetry, we can take this magnetic field out. So it's a, because it, it, is a, it is a constant. 
on the any point on of the loop so it's it's a constant uh, integration of the length of the ampere loop gives us 2 pi r small okay and for the i r we get, we get i capital 0 r squared over r capital squared okay so now we can we can cancel one r <clears throat> and divide both sides by two pi <clears throat> so we get the magnetic field uh, it's equal to i r over two pi r capital squared and this formula works when uh, uh, r less than r capital okay so oops. This is the magnetic field in any point inside the conducting conducting cylinder. Uh, with uniformly distributed current, of course. Okay, uh, which is usually the case uh, for this for the static field for the static uh, scenario. Okay, and the. Uh, <clears throat> outside right so this this was inside so second is outside outside magnetic field so for the outside the any current that is surrounded by this ampere slope is equal to the total current that goes through the cylinder so it's i zero right so the any current for r larger than r capital is equal to i i zero okay and uh, for the <clears throat> ampere's law again we have this integral out dl is equal to to the current so now again magnetic field is uh, constant on the ampere slope the integration of ampere slope give us give us two pi r small because this is the radius of the loop uh, ampere loop uh, and it's equal to i i zero okay so this magnetic field outside the conducting cylinder is i zero over two pi r small yeah so this is the second part of the second part of the answer so this way we define these magnetic fields inside and outside without any integrations just uh, using the ampere's law okay <clears throat> just using the ampere's law so let us consider maybe another another problem problem number two and let's choose the one that is like uh, shorter so let's let's de let's determine the magnetic field um, inside of a toroidal coil. Okay, so magnetic magnetic field inside a toroidal toroidal coil. Uh, with n terms and uh, current i okay so n terms and uh, current i so what is uh, the toroidal coil so toroidal coil so let us imagine let us imagine a toroid like this like this okay <clears throat> and uh, i write the wire over this coil like um, like this right
Something like this, uh, and also this parts connected. So it's steroidal uh, coil, like donut shaped. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, coil, yeah, and and of course in reality this <clears throat> this uh, turns they are like densely packed on the surface of the of, of the of the of the toroid. So because of this, I mean this structure gets magnetic field. So if if the wire is supports mag uh, the current, of course the magnetic field is localized inside of this toroid. So it's a uh, magnetic field and magnetic field is inside and our problem or task is to find this uh, magnetic field in there so again we can use this ampere's law for the circulation of the magnetic field around ampere's loop so we take ampere's loop like this in, located inside of this uh, inside of this uh, uh, toroidal coil okay so it's a uh, uh, integral like like this and it's equal to the total current that goes through the area uh, through the area so here the area is uh, this big area here okay so basically the total current that goes through this area is simply equal to the number of terms that uh, go through this uh, through this area, right? So it's equal to so it's a total here. And it's equal to the current in one single term times the number of terms. Okay, and again, magnetic field is <clears throat> is uh, constant um, at the at the at the ampere slope and its length is two pi times uh, r well r capital let's denote it by capital so this uh, this is the radius here r capital and it's equal to current times n so the magnetic field inside this uh toroidal coil is equal to i times n over 2 pi r capital, okay? So it's an interesting result because uh, this magnetic field grows if number of coils grow. Like I, I can take a hundred turns and uh, I get some amount of magnetic field, but if I take like thousand turns I'll get magnetic field, which is 10 times, uh, 10 times stronger, right? Yeah, so this is, <clears throat> this is about uh, Ampere's law. But as I said, this Ampere's law works only if the current is uh, constant, if it is DC case. DC stays for the direct current, right? So for the for the DC current, but what about uh, AC current when the current and the fields change in time in 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 a, in a system? In this case, <clears throat> we get another type of current, which is called displacement current. So I guess I believe it's point number eight now. Yeah, it's point number eight. Point number eight. <clears throat> displacement current. Displacement. Displacement current. And here we also discuss the Maxwell addition. Maxwell addition. <clears throat> So you, 
probably know Maxwell was a theoretical physicist and uh, uh, what he basically did, he sum up all the experimental facts about electromagnetic fields and uh, wrote down his famous e equations. But first, uh, first version of the equations were not symmetric in terms of the uh, the exchange of uh, electric and magnetic fields. Like electric field creates magnetic field, but magnetic field doesn't create electric field and vice versa. And he didn't like this asymmetry and for the, for the sake of symmetry, because he believed in the beauty of the equations, he decided to introduce a one extra term to the equations and this term changed basically everything so because of that extra term to the to the equations uh we discovered electromagnetic electromagnetic fields we uh, understood that light and radio fields microwave fields they are I mean, basically, naturally, is the same. It's just electromagnetic field manifestation of of the same of the same thing, and uh, a lot of other uh, consequences. All right, <clears throat> and uh, the the discussion about the displacement current and Maxwell addition. We start with the the case of a uh, Capacitor. Okay, so the capacitor. Capacitor. So capacitor is a system of two metallic, uh, <clears throat> basically any objects of two metallic objects. Oh, let me try it. This, this this color. So the the object one, object two. It can be. Uh, a plate, it can be cylinders, literally anything. Uh, usually for the for the plate, plate parallel capacitor, it's a, it's a system of two plates. Uh, and uh, I can connect this place, these objects to some electric uh, uh, the power supply electric field generator and uh, if i connect this to the to the battery which is uh, dc power supply uh, this system basically will get charge uh, one will get one part will get some extra positive charge in another one will get some extra negative charge. And of course, if I remove the battery, the charges will stay here because they uh, attract each other, right? So they will stay on the, on the, on the, on the metallic parts of this, of this system. So this system can be charged meaning provide we can provide some extra charge on both uh, parts and this charge will leave there because of the column interaction plus charge will attract the minus one and vice versa and they will stay <clears throat> they will stay there so we can trap the charges using this system but of course <clears throat> since the space between these two uh, these two parts is vacuum uh, the current cannot go through the vacuum, right? So the vacuum doesn't support the current because of no uh, charged particles there. So the current cannot go through, <clears throat> the current can go through this capacitor. But what if I, I connect this, cap this capacitor to the, uh, AC uh, power supply, which generates the uh, the current that is that changes in time. Okay, 
So I can connect and consider what's going to happen in this case. So in this case, of course, this plus charge and minus charge will change in time. <clears throat> and I can apply the Gauss uh, theorem or the first uh, Maxwell equation <clears throat> to the system. And I can sur surround this one part of the system by a uh, auxiliary surface, surface S, okay? So I just surround one part of the capacitor with the with some um, auxiliary uh, auxiliary surface just for the just for the calculation. So due to due to the Gauss law, Gauss law. <clears throat> we get what we get the fact that the flux of electric field through any surface and uh, in, a, in this case for this uh, surface s uh, is equal to the charge inside this area right over epsilon zero over epsilon zero <clears throat> oops just mm -hmm. okay uh okay uh, do you see my screen now anyone yes yes we can see the screen Okay, awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> I don't know for some reason I lost there. All right. So from this formula, I can define the the charge, right? So the charge from this formula is equal to simply the product of epsilon zero times the integral e ds. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so next. What is the current? Current in any system, current is the time derivative of, 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 of charge. So I can take the time derivative of this charge, right? And get the current. So basically the current that I supply to this, to this system, okay? So let's take the time derivative of, of this integral. Yes. Okay, epsilon zero. <clears throat> so the time de time derivative and uh, uh, special special integration can be exchanged. Okay. Uh, so I can write epsilon zero and then the integral. Insert the time derivative into the integral. But this time derivative becomes the partial uh, derivative because because after taking the integral integration here, right, the result will be only the function of time. That's why time derivative by time because it doesn't depend on on the on coordinates. When I introduce the time derivative in inside the integration in integral. I have to write the partial derivative because the function, uh, um, the in integrand depends on <clears throat> depends on not only time but also the uh, coordinates. So I write dE over dt, right, and uh, ds. Okay. <clears throat> on the other hand, the the current. Through this through this surface here <clears throat> is given by so we have only one current that goes through the surface right only this one that comes through the surface here and in other places we don't have any uh, charge I mean, real cards okay so it's given by the integral of the current density times ds over this 
this surface. Nice. Okay. So these two <clears throat> formulas, these two expressions, are supposed to be equal, give the same result, and we can we come to the conclusion that the current density in this case is equal to uh, the epsilon zero times the partial derivative of e by time, right? Yes. Okay, so <clears throat> this is pretty important result because uh, this formula basically tells us that the, the electric field changing in time <clears throat> uh, works as a new, new type of a current. Okay, so we denote this current, the displacement current. So we put D and uh, since now we will put the, uh, I mean, we will denote the conduction current uh, by putting C uh, by, by, the, by, the, by, by the letter. Uh, to distinguish the two types of the current. So displacement current and uh, conduction current. So displace so electric field changing in time is uh, uh, works as the <clears throat> current. And we will see that this type of the current also creates magnetic field. So it's, it works as a real as a real current, even though uh, <clears throat> even though, it goes through the vacuum from one part of the capacitor to to the the second part of the capacitor. So this current is called displacement current. Displacement current. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so this displacement current is basically the the Maxwell Maxwell addition. Maxwell and shown to the Ampere's law. Ampere's law, right? So now <clears throat> this um, Ampere's law, which is uh, this one, right? The curl of magnetic field equals to the current. So now this current is not just the conduction current, but also the uh, also the displacement current. <clears throat> so the curl of magnetic field is equal to the conduction current, as we already used to, plus this uh, second term, this uh, displacement current, dE over d over dt. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let us also frame this formula. Okay, and uh, this is uh, let's let's name this mag uh, Maxwell 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 equation number three. <clears throat> so this is the third equation, third Maxwell equation. Uh, so, as I, as I said, Maxwell introduced this term like completely theoretically from, uh, I mean, in order to make the whole entire system of Maxwell equations symmetric. <clears throat> and it gets many, many consequences. <clears throat> of course, one consequence is like if you ever connected a capacitor to to a AC current, you you notice that the current actually AC current can actually go through through the capacitor. So it conducts uh, it conducts the 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 current. Um, and uh, and this term here describes this describes this effect. Uh, 
other consequences, of course, the existence of electromagnetic fields, as we will <clears throat> see shortly. Okay, should we should we discuss any should we consider any problems? Yeah, let, let's consider a, a problem <clears throat> at the at the case of this capacitor. So problem problem number one. I think because of the lack of the time, let's consider only one problem. <clears throat> so the problem, uh, problem or let's describe the capacitor more uh, closely. So let's find find electric and uh, magnetic field inside inside. Uh, uh, or be, let's 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 say between between the plates of a parallel of parallel uh, capacitor of a parallel <clears throat> capacitor. Uh, so let us assume that the, the capacitor, capacitor is charged, charged by current and the current, we assume the current is sinusoidal. So it gets the amplitude and uh, sine omega t. Okay, so this, this is the current. I remind you that omega here is the angular frequency, right? So angular, angular frequency, and it's equal to two pi f. F is the <clears throat> usual frequency. All right, so <clears throat> the goal is to find electrical magnetic field inside of the uh, of the parallel capacitor. So let us draw the picture. Let us draw the the capacitor schematically like this. So this is the first plate. This is the second plate. Again, I can excite the current in these wires, uh, connectors. <clears throat> and uh, when I charge the capacitor, for example, this one can get plus Q, this one gets, of course, minus Q. And uh, the charges on the, on the plates of the capacitor, they, they create the electric field that points from plus to minus, positive charge to negative charge, okay? Uh, <clears throat> And what else? So the current by definition is given by the time derivative of the charge on the plates, okay? If the charge changes in time, we get uh, non-vanishing uh, vanishing current. All right, so first let us find the electric field, E field, okay? So <clears throat> for the E field, uh, so <clears throat> it's instructive to introduce the, uh, the surface charge density so when we describe the distribution of a charge over some area, some surfaces, we count the charges per unit of area, <clears throat> right? So we introduce the charge density to describe the charge distribution over, over the surface. And uh, the way we do that, we simply, uh, <clears throat> divide the charge by the by the area right so in our case the 
the charge distribution is <coughs> is uniform so the <coughs> the surface charge density is equal to the charge over the area so a is the area area of the of a single plate area of the single plate sigma is a surface charge density surface charge then surface charge density q is the total charge <clears throat> okay so in order to define the the electric field we we will use gauss law and to use gauss law we need to surround a part of this uh, capacitor by auxiliary surface okay so this green uh, here is the is the auxiliary surface okay um, and for this surface we write down the <coughs> Gauss law so electric field times uh, d ds or, or okay let's use the same the same letter <coughs> ds is equal to one over epsilon zero q uh, on a single plate so the q enclosed in in the in this in this area is the auxiliary area so it's uh, enclosed q enclosed <coughs> okay so for this geometry, the electric field is assumed to be zero outside, okay? Uh, for a simple reason. <clears throat> so if you have two charged uh, plates like this, one gets pluses here, which creates the, the uh, outward field like this, right? And the second plate gets minuses, okay? <clears throat> Which creates the uh, inward field, like this. So this is the field of the negative charge. Uh, <clears throat> so as you can see, the fields outside of the place they cancel they cancel down because they almost the same but oppositely <clears throat> directed and only field that is inside from plus to minus it, it doesn't cancel down so for the <clears throat> for the capacitor for the parallel plate capacitor the field outside is vanishing uh, even though the field inside could be uh, actually very, very strong, okay? Uh, because some of the modern capacitors, they can support even one coulomb of charge, which is, <clears throat> which is huge. So the field inside will be extremal, like very, very large, but outside it will be vanishing. <clears throat> So for this reason, the flux, <clears throat> the flux of the electric field through this surface, this surface, this surface is equal to zero simply because the field is zero. And we only, only have one contribution uh, for the flux that goes through the area, which is equal to the area of one, of one single um, plate, okay? So for this reason, we get <clears throat> electric field, it's a constant inside the capacitor, times the area of one plate, and it's equal to one epsilon zero Q, okay, on this, on this plate. And the Q is equal to sigma A, the surface charge density. So it's equal to epsilon epsilon zero, <clears throat> surface charge density times, times, a. Okay, so the 
the field inside the capacitor is simply equal to uh, uh, one epsilon zero sigma. <clears throat> pretty simple, pretty simple re uh, re results. So this is for electric field. And of course, if this uh, charge uh, changes in time, the results stay the same uh, and described by this, <clears throat> this simple formula. So what about the magnetic field? So let's consider the H, <clears throat> H field. So H field, so H field inside the capacitor can exist if electric field changes in time. So electric field must change in, in time. <clears throat> Must change in time. <clears throat> Otherwise, <clears throat> uh, because no charges between the, the plates, so, hence no <clears throat> DC current, hence no magnetic field. And only <clears throat> the changing in time uh, charges, changing in time uh, electric field can create <clears throat> the magnetic field inside of the capacitor. Otherwise, this mag magnetic field uh, will be zero, okay? And uh, we already know that we associate, we attribute the changing electric field in time with the displacement current, <clears throat> JD, which is equal to epsilon zero, DE over DT, okay? So this is the <clears throat> displacement current. Displacement, displacement current. On other hand, we just define that <clears throat> electric field inside of the inside of the capacitor is given by this formula here. Okay, so it's gonna be one over epsilon zero q over a q over a. So let us take the time derivative of the electric field epsilon zero <clears throat> area doesn't change in time so let's take it out from the derivative and uh, finally we get the time derivative of the <clears throat> of the charge uh, over time okay and uh, by definition <clears throat> the time derivative of charge over time is equal to the current. So it simply equals to one over epsilon zero a current depending on <clears throat> depending on time. And uh, uh, our <clears throat> problem statement tells us that the current is described by this function. So we plug in this formula for the current epsilon zero a <clears throat> and the current is given i uh, zero sine right sine sine omega t <clears throat> sine omega t so this is the value of the electric field <clears throat> and it's time derivative uh, of, of the field inside the inside the capacitor. And now if I multiply this by epsilon zero, I get the, uh, the value of the density of the displacement current, right? So it's gonna be, it's gonna be I zero over A uh, sine omega T. <clears throat> so this is the uh, displacement current. Okay, so now for the for the Ampere's law with Maxwell addition, we can we can so before that we need to we need to uh, select uh, Ampere's loop, okay, between the uh, between the plates inside the capacitor. So let us. Uh, 
let us <clears throat> right uh, let us draw the capacitor like in perspective maybe like this so this is the first plate this is the second plate and the <clears throat> amperes and the uh, electric field it's going to look like this this is the electric field okay field we need to uh, draw a <clears throat> ampere loop like this with a uh, <clears throat> with uh, the radius r small okay and this is the center of of the system uh, okay so now for this <clears throat> for this system i can write the ampere law for the <clears throat> for the loop L, okay, so this is a loop L, and by the uh, ampere law with Maxwell addition, uh, this integral is equal to the sum of all currents that go through the area of this, of this ampere slope, um, uh, ampere slope. <clears throat> So it's going to be a conductive current plus <clears throat> total displacement current. Displacement current. So the conducting current <clears throat> obviously equal to zero, no charges there. And displacement current. Displacement current uh, is equal to. <clears throat> so since the current doesn't change on coordinates in the inside the capacitor it's uniquely uh, it's uh, uniform it's uniform inside the inside the capacitor so for the total current for the total displacement current i can write simply the the current density times the area of of the plates of the capacitor okay so this will be the the total displacement current uh, <clears throat> that goes through through the through the um, ampere loop <clears throat> so it's going to be not the area of the capacitor it's going to be area of the loop so let's put al here okay uh, we just define this <clears throat> this current so it's going to be i0 of a sine omega t times a l okay <clears throat> so now uh, <clears throat> magnetic field again is uh, constant because of the cylindrical symmetry of the system so it's going to be h times 2 p r for the length of the ampere loop <clears throat> equal to I zero sine omega T over over A and the and the area of the Ampere loop is pi R <clears throat> squared. So we can we can cancel to we can cancel pi we can pi R here here so the result is uh, for the magnetic field we get this formula here <clears throat> so it's going to be i0 then sine omega t over 2a and what else and, and times r and this r is <clears throat> pretty interesting thing so this is the magnetic field inside of the parallel plate capacitor. And we can notice several interesting things here. Uh, the first one is the fact that the displacement current is indeed the source of magnetic field. The displacement current is the source of 
magnetic field. <clears throat> All right. Or in other in other in other in other words, the changing in time electric field is the source of magnetic field. <clears throat> Interesting fact. So the second fact here is uh, uh, well, if if omega if frequency is zero, so it's a DC <clears throat> DC DC case. The magnetic field is also zero. Magnetic field is also zero. <clears throat> so since displacement current doesn't exist <clears throat> at D in DC, magnetic field also uh, equal to zero <clears throat> inside the capacitor in, in DC case. And third, um, <clears throat> if R is equal to zero, so in the center of capacitor, the magnetic field also equal to equal to zero. So in the in the, in the center of capacitor, magnetic field equal to zero, and uh, changes its sign, right? So if R is positive, meaning uh, I go above this central line, uh, the magnetic field is uh, positive, meaning the vector of magnetic field points into like one direction. Uh, when I go down, the R becomes negative. So magnetic field points in the opposite direction. And I conclude that for, for this case, the magnetic field is supposed to be like a circle oriented, right? So like this. So this would be the <clears throat> lines of magnetic field inside and zero, zero in the center. Yeah, so you see <clears throat> pretty, so using the Gauss law and the Ampere's law, it's pretty <clears throat> easy to, um, to analyze the problems like <clears throat> problems like this. Okay, so this was the uh, point number nine, uh, number eight. So let's go to point number nine now. So the point number nine, <clears throat> maybe the most uh, important part for the for the electrical engineers i mean all this is very important of course uh, so it's let's name this electromagnetic induction law electromagnetic electro magnetic mag electromagnetic induction law or Faraday's law. Faraday's law. So Faraday is a was a scientist, a great scientist, great experimentalist. In contrast to Maxwell, he was a experimentalist, and he dis discovered this uh, <clears throat> this effect of electromagnetic induction. And today is actually the his birthday. Uh, right, so very nice that we are talking about Faraday's law uh, today. All right, so what <clears throat> Faraday discovered, uh, he discovered the fact that variation of the magnetic field uh, leads to the creation of the circle of, oh, sorry, of the curl of, uh, of electric field. Okay, so Faraday... Or they discovered that variation of the magnetic field, I mean, uh, I mean the time variation of magnetic field, time variation of B uh, <clears throat> leads to creation, leads to 
uh, creation of curl, curl of electric field, curl of E field. Okay, so <clears throat> for example, if we consider a wire loop, like now it is a real, uh, a real wire loop like this, okay, uh, <clears throat> with some element TL over here, uh, and uh, this loop is placed in a magnetic field like this and this magnetic field time changes in time somehow and also uh, what we need we need also to denote the area surrounded by this uh, by this loop so it's uh, area s okay and the element here yeah, the element is the l <clears throat> So what Faraday observed is that the circulation of electric field in this case <clears throat> is equal to the minus time derivative <clears throat> of the flux of the magnetic field through the area uh, of surrounded by the by the wire okay so this is pretty important <clears throat> experimental fact so by definition the the flux of magnetic field is equal to the integral of the mag of the magnetic field through the surface s Okay. <clears throat> this is by definition. <clears throat> and uh, on the other hand, we can rewrite this circulation again using the <clears throat> uh, curl uh, integral theorem. So it's going to be the, uh, the flux of the curl of electric field through the same area okay it's equal to uh, minus d dt the flux b ds okay again we can insert this time derivative to the to the integral here and we get uh, we get minus integral db over dt, the partial time deri uh, derivative for the reason we discussed today, uh, <clears throat> ds, okay? And uh, so now these integrals equal, the areas of integration equal, that means that the integrands are equal to, and we can we come to this uh, final sir, uh, force uh, Maxwell equation. The fact that the curl of electric field is equal to minus dB over dt. Okay, so this is the force. Uh, Maxwell equation number four. <clears throat> Final Maxwell equation. So let us state the Faraday's law this way. Faraday's law this way. The electromotive force, the electromotive force this is basically what he observed that a coil a loop placed inside of the uh, time varying changing magnetic field creates or induces the 
electromotive force, uh, which is basically the voltage. Okay, the voltage on the ends of the of, of the loop. Uh, the electromagnetic force we denoted by EMF, right? Electromotive force uh, induced induced in any in any closed closed circuit <clears throat> is equal to the negative the negative uh, the negative rate of uh, of change rate of change of magnetic flux of, through that circuit magnetic flux through the circuit okay so any circuit uh, i mean uh, for example a loop uh, a closed loop you place this loop inside a magnetic field and uh, if magnetic field is constant you observe no action no effect but if magnetic field oscillates uh, changes in time uh, anyhow it creates the electromotive force on the connection uh, and the contacts of the of the loop so electromag electromotive force is equal to minus d over d <clears throat> over dt of fb this is the faraday's law faraday's law and uh, <clears throat> since this faraday's law the time dependence of the flux of magnetic field uh, is equal to the <clears throat> is equal to the circulation of electric field because of this formula circulation of the electric field uh, in, in the in the circuit uh, electric field in the circuit uh, hence electromotive force is equivalent to the circulation of uh, of electric field uh, over a closed over a closed loop circulation equivalent uh, electromotive force is equivalent is is equal equal, equal to the circulation circulation of of electric fields uh, in in a closed loop in a closed loop. <clears throat> okay, so this is the physical meaning of circulation of electric field. Circulation of electric field is the is equal to uh, to the electromotive force created in the in the loop. Okay. Uh, Created in the loop. <clears throat> so let us maybe uh, consider a problem, one or two problems. Um, sorry. Uh, okay. So <clears throat> yeah, let's consider us. Let, let's consider two problems. Problem. Number one about the Faraday's law. Uh, let's take a rectangular loop, a rectangular rectangular loop with uh, <clears throat> width equals zero point five meters and uh, height of one meter. For simplicity in a uniform magnetic field magnetic field uniform uniform 
And suppose this magnetic field changes in time like uh, five times T. Tesla per second, okay. So, <clears throat> uh, and as the time passes, the magnetic field grows and this growing is linear. Uh, and question is, what is electromotive force at time, at time, for example, two, two seconds? <clears throat> what is electromotive force and time two second. Okay, so let us draw a simple picture here. So this is our rectangular <clears throat> rectangular loop with uh, with uh, height. Uh, we get magnetic field here and this magnetic field changes in time. And for example, somewhere here, we can disconnect this loop, uh, make a little gap right and measure the electromotive force uh, between these two points okay uh, and if this loop generates any or gets any uh, voltage induced we can use this to uh, i mean to drive to power supply any uh, maybe electric device or whatever so electromotive force, <clears throat> electromotive force by definition is uh, uh, minus d f b the magnetic flux over d t right. The magnetic flux here is simply the time the magnetic field times the area of this <clears throat> of this loop. Area doesn't change, so let's take it out. And the magnetic and the d over dt magnetic field. Magnetic field is five times t, right? The area uh, is equal to zero point five times one, which is zero point five. Uh, zero point five times five is two point five. And d t over d t is one, so the answer is minus two point five. So the uh, electromotive force is equal to minus two point five. So even though magnetic field changes linearly in time, and it can change like a long time. Uh, the electromotive force it generates is constant, minus 2.5, okay? So this is the answer to the first one. Let's consider maybe another problem. Problem two. <clears throat> Let's take something very simple, very, very quick. So, so, um, let's practice the, the force Maxwell equation. So let's assume, <clears throat> <clears throat> Let's assume that in some area we have a magnetic field that depends <clears throat> on space and time as a cosine function, cosine k uh, t and uh, minus k z. Okay, so. <clears throat> Let me see, yk, let's put omega, omega t minus kz. So <clears throat> this magnetic field changes in time as a cosine function, okay? And also it changes in space <clears throat> as, a cosine as a cosine function. It changes in, sp in space over z direction, in, in z direction, but the, um, the orientation of magnetic field is along x x direction. Okay, so let's find uh, find uh, the curl of electric field. Okay, at time moment, initial time moment, and uh, in the center of uh, coordinate system. So it's uh, t equal to zero, z equal to zero. All right, so. <clears throat> 
the curl of electric field is simply equal to minus db over dt. Okay. So this is what we know from the Faraday's experiments. In order to find the curl, we just need to take the time derivative of the magnetic field. So the time derivative of the magnetic field, the partial derivative, which means that we don't need to take the derivative by, by z. So it's only time derivative. So time derivative of cosine is equal to minus sine. The function itself, <coughs> time i. And uh, <coughs> times the derivative of the omega t, which is omega, omega here times i, okay. And what is equal, what is db over dt, t equal to zero, z equal to zero. It's equal to zero because sine of zero is equal to zero, so it's zero. Hence, the curl of electric field is equal to zero. <clears throat> simple, simple result. And maybe the last thing for today, uh, let's discuss some applications of the Faraday's law. Okay, some, some, some applications. applications of the Faraday's law. Faraday's law. Some some of the applications of the Faraday's law. The very first <clears throat> application, of course, is the uh, transformers, right? So it's uh, uh, one of the most important transformers. Transformers. <clears throat> so transformers. So what is a transformer? Uh, we will probably simulate one of these. Uh, but for now, just let me uh, quickly describe how 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 it looks like, how how it works. So the transformer gets two coils. The first coil and the second coil. <clears throat> first coil, second coil. Uh, the first coil is supposed to, I mean, can be connected to a to the alternating current, and this alternating current uh, creates magnetic field. And this magnetic field will be <clears throat> changing in time. Okay, so this magnetic field will change in time because the current <clears throat> in the first coil is uh, alternating AC current. And this <clears throat> changing in time magnetic field, of course, because of the Faraday's law, it will create the electromotive force in the second, in the second coil. And uh, if one connects some some kind of a load to the second coil, we will observe the the, the current in this load in, the, in this in this load. Right. So it's important to have this because uh, the, a transformer can increase the voltage uh, in the second coil. It can reduce the voltage in the second coil, but increase the current so that the power is conserved, right? And also, if you need to make a circuit where two parts of the circuit will be electrically isolated, disconnected from one another, transformer this, I mean, does this, uh, uh, this job. Yeah, so connection of two of two coils. So another <clears throat> application of Faraday's law, Faraday's effect is the uh, motors and generators, motors and uh, generators, generators. 
All right? So motors and generators, typically they get several uh, several coils, for example, three coils, one here, one can be somewhere here, the third one somewhere here. So three coils. <clears throat> for example, <clears throat> three phase electricity, right? So the generators that generate three phase uh, electricity, they have three coils. And uh, the, the magnet placed somewhere here, so it is a, a magnet. So this is, uh, I believe, nurse. This is nurse. <clears throat> okay. And uh, yeah, so basically, uh, if this magnet rotates uh, in a system like this, this magnet rotates, it creates the uh, changing magnetic field in time in the uh, places of the of the coils. And this changing magnetic field creates the electromotive force in each of these coils. And then <clears throat> one, one can connect these coils for example for example like this <clears throat> uh, oops it's gonna be a second uh, second first second first second first anyway so <clears throat> there are two types of connection of this of this of these coils so that you have only three uh, connectors left, right? And these three connectors are the free phased <clears throat> electricity that come to our buildings. Yeah, and uh, this is how basically a generator works. And uh, the motor works the same way. Uh, you, you supply, you, you excite these uh, coils uh by i mean the, you uh, apply a, a power supply to these coils these coils uh, they create the rotating magnetic field in the position of the magnet and this rotating magnetic field causes the the magnet to to rotate right this is the this is how motors work <clears throat> and for example this Electric vehicles, they were they use this this these motors to uh, for driving. I mean, I mean anyway, so it's so, so many applications of this. Another another application of the Faraday's law is of course uh, wire uh, wireless power transfer, VPT, wireless wireless power transfer. <clears throat> okay, so in wireless power transfer, again, we have two coils, one coil like this, this is the first coil uh, called transmitter, transmitter, uh, we have another coil, which is called uh, receiver, receiver. The receiver is connected to uh, some sort of a load, load. For example, a, <clears throat> a toothbrush, right? Uh, <clears throat> the transmitter, it's connected to <clears throat> some sort of a current generator. This current generator drives the current, current creates the alternating magnetic field. This magnetic field, because of the Faraday's law, creates the uh, induces the current in the second in the receiver, and the load absorbs this uh, absorbs this power absorbs this current. This is and uh, this way we can transfer electricity, electric field, electric energy, without any wires. Okay. 
for example, in my lab, we actively working on different concepts in wireless power transfer quite uh, extensively. Uh, and maybe the last one is the uh, another the last example among I mean, a lot of many uh, applications we consider just four. So the, the fourth is the metal metal detectors. Metal detector. Metal detectors. <clears throat> so what they do, they detect hidden metals. Detect hidden uh, metals. Okay. So <clears throat> again, we deal with two coils. One is uh, like this. And uh, we put another coil, secondary coil like this. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the first one is a source, source. The second one is detector, detector, detector coil. Okay. So what, what happens is that uh, the source coil creates magnetic field uh, that is oscillating, changing in time, changing in time magnetic field. And this changing magnetic field in time, it induces the electromotive force in the second, in the second uh, so, uh, detector coil, okay? <clears throat> and we can measure this potential on the second coil. And now, if I bring some kind of metallic object inside this uh, magnetic field, this metallic object, the magnetic field creates currents in the <clears throat> currents in the metallic object, and metallic object, this current creates the uh, its own magnetic field. So this magnetic field affects the magnetic field uh, um, <clears throat> observed by the by the detector, and hence this uh, this electromotive force here changes, and we can detect this uh, change in the in the magnetic field. So any object will be detected by the change of the of the magnetic field. So I guess this is all for for today. Uh, let me stop the recording and uh, we can discuss this material.